Straight out of Compton, a crazy motherfucker named Ice Cube. From a gang called Niggers with Attitude. When I'm called off, I got a sawed off. Squeeze a trigger and bodies are hauled off. You too, boy, if you fuck with me. Police are gonna have to come and get me off your ass. That's how I'm going out for the punk motherfuckers that's showing out. Niggas start to Rot. mama, they wanna run my mix of the cook them up in a pile like I'm going off on a motherfucker like that with a gat that's pointed at your ass. So give it up, smooth. Good morning, Cape Town. It's very nice to be back in Cape Town. I love this city because it's one of the most multicultural places in the world. And it's a place that really, I begin to understand context. And what I'm going to talk to you about this morning, I came here 11 years ago and presented most of my high profile work. And I thank Michael for a very nice introduction. And today I'm not going to talk to you about this. I'm going to talk to you about side project. So, I've been making a book out of recycled byproduct. So things that I've thought of, ideas that I've thought of, photographs that I've taken along the way of a 20 year journey through making and reinventing global brands. The book's called Molecular Brand Chemistry. And most conventional marketing wisdom, creativity experts, even some media philosophers, they pontificate about content being the new advertising. So context of your world becomes very important. So you've got to ask yourself, what is the context of your world? So I ask this in terms of branding. So what I generally look at, I look at brands like DNA. So I, so I try to look at brands at an atomic level work out how to energize them so you get the atoms vibrating. And you get the atoms vibrating that, that are to do with relevancy of the audience. So the stuff that people give a, really give a shit about rather than the stuff that somebody wants to push on you. So, a couple of questions become important. I've been lucky in the last sort of uh, 15 years of the 20-year journey working for privately held companies with private owners. So it's very important what the owner thinks of their brand. So this is a little bit about, you know, what is their association with the audience? What kind of offer do they have in the world? What do they believe in philosophically? You know, and most brands need to get mind share to survive, you know, because you've got to have some conceptual ownership of something. So a brand's got to stand for something in the 21st century, because if you don't stand for anything, you fall. If you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. What does the world think of the owner's brand? Also a very important question, probably more important question, because this is really about how an audience perceives a brand. So is it a product? Is it a mindset or a mind style or a lifestyle? Is it a physical space? Is it a feeling? or an emotion? Is it just a set of values that people believe in? Or is it a reaction? And then generally the owner, he's going to ask me before he allows me to tinker, fuck around with his brand, make some genetic DNA manipulation, you know, he's going to want me to consider the factors and changes that affect their business. And in fashion, this is very interesting because everything fragmented, you know, so media fragmented, shopping became multi-platform, channels ceased to be important, fashion business was always beautiful photographs in glossy magazines, whole mechanic change, so that question's very important. And what happens is, what I've seen over 20 years, is that the context becomes critical for content to have any relevancy in modern culture, because in the end, Look, people have a lot of messages. People are exposed to a lot of commercial messages every day. And the ones that stick are the ones that have relevancy, because you can feel them. A little bit like music. So what the world thinks about the brand, this is key, because that's what influences reputation and brand image perception. And then later, when companies get very big, you know, that becomes critical, because that influences their equity and money and what they're worth. 
So if I think about 20 years ago, when I started working for Levi's, entering by accident into this world, I was a scientist, so my context was already different. When I entered into this world, if I looked at the list of top 10 most valued brands in the world, the day I started working for Levi's, on this list would be Levi's, then it'd be Coca-Cola, then it'd be the big traditional American companies that you expect. Today, that list, Levi's isn't on that list anymore, and Apple, Google, Amazon are at the top of that list as the most valuable companies in the world. They did not really exist in that list 20 years ago. So it shows you a little bit how the world's changing. So I think of a brand like a, and how to tune it like a set of branding dials to turn up, up or down certain aspects of the DNA. So you've got to work out which aspects for your audience you need to turn up or down. And the world's changed. So there's this factor about sort of business, you know? So previously, size was everything. You know, the biggest guy wins, generally. Today, size isn't everything because it's the impact of what somebody says that does or does that matters. So it's a little bit like the opposite of advertising. Why? Because we live in an attention economy. That means economics is driven by attention. In that world, in that context, especially for fashion, we live in a time where everybody is cool and all fashion is fast. So you've got to do something really surprising to get noticed. And many changes going on in the world, you know, geopolitical changes that have an impact. So there's everything from climate changes, populations increase, everybody moves to the city, economies stall, you know, Western Europe's like this today, and we got a crazy ride for 10 years. And in those 10 years, so these are the next 10 years I talk about now, is going to be challenging. There are going to be a lot of problems in the world. At the same time, it depends how you look at the world. So that can also create a moment that is very optimistic and very creative, if you know what you're doing. I love Santiago's presentation because he's obviously a man who does know what he's doing, and I think he understands very well how to find optimism and creativity in problems. So, what I do is often, I'm going to show you chapters of the book, but just a selected few that have relevancy to sort of a few examples and case studies in the middle. So, Mostly what I do is I recontextualize the brand. So I tune it ready for the space that they want to go into, depending on what they want to do. So I think of it like an add-in value machine. Ultimately, what's driving me is, you know, we've got to educate our own desires to freely consider alternatives to consume better. I want to show you a couple of examples now. So for six years, I was the global creative director at Camper, and I was making very strange advertising that was appearing in glossy magazines, and I was not using good-looking people. I was not using models. I was casting everybody from the street, generally using sort of old people, farmers, boche players, construction workers. And I was trying to make Camper, who were a national Spanish family-owned, industrially integrated company. So it means that the grandfather they're on the factory, he gives it to the son, the son gives it to his grandson, and that's the guy who I met, who's the owner of Camper. So they had a brand that was, you know, energized in Spain, but they wanted to go global. And they knew, and he was very interesting because he knew that he wanted to find a different set of codes to go global. So he said to me, can you make this? So I said to him, okay, then I've got to live in the countryside, I've got to grow vegetables, pump water out the ground, chop wood, make fire, live like a hippie to understand your brand and to understand rural reality. And the fact that you're from Mallorca and the Mediterranean, this can be a big power in your DNA because it's so differentiating, because most of the brands in fashion, footwear, you know, they don't glamorize the Mediterranean. New York, LA, Tokyo, these are the cities and the worlds that are glamorized. So I just want to play a little film, which I'm not going to show you the campaigns, because probably with media fragmenting and the stuff that I said, you can find it all online anyway. So I'm going to show you a film that roots the brand's DNA and visualizes it in Mallorca.
So I was beginning to build this picture of the Mediterranean. So I was taking stuff that wasn't cool or deemed cool in the fashion world and making it suddenly cool. So this allowed her adding in also, which you see in the film, of sustainability. So adding in the fact that Camper would then begin to make shoes out of uh, bioplastic, out of potatoes and corn. So that's, that's what you saw in there. And reducing the operations in a shoe factory, which, let's say, a pair of Nike sneakers, 160 operations. The shoe that you saw on the film, eight operations. Big difference. So it's changing their mindset as well. And at the same time, keeping pushing on this idea of the Mediterranean, you know? So I was making stuff out of uh, reality, stuff I found in the street. So it's just cars to get off the street, using locations in the street. Again, little, you know, little recycling of reality. And then we made this idea about walk, don't run. So a philosophy, you know, going to get the opposite of Nike. So if Nike says run, campers walk. If Nike says air, campers earth. So using this counterintuitive, contradictory approach to constructing their DNA. And then as people get used to the Mediterranean, and as, again, back to the question about, you know, which factors affect a business. One of the things was, as we got five years into this, you know, business was changing, the world was changing, and Camper were traditionally making their shoes, many by hand, in Mallorca, small sort of different factories, network of factories. It, it was inevitable that they would switch and go to making a lot of shoes in China, which is inevitable because half the stuff we use is made in China. So it allowed the idea also to move into recontextualizing again that world and that idea of the Mediterranean for global reality. So then I switched all the campaign and started shooting it in the most upcoming cities in the world. So this was at that time Mumbai, San Paolo, cities like this that are not the Mediterranean, and then finding a similar kind of DNA. So I'll show you a switch now. Um, shanti, 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 oh. So you get the idea. So what? I, so then I arrived into the G-style world, and then that was a very different world, and the world had changed. So I was working in the street for 15 years, casting people off the street, very using social reality, 
almost making the ordinary extraordinary. Then what happened was celebrity became very, very important for all brands. And in a way, today, they're the most effective sales force of the age because they are the ones that popularize ideas, behaviors, brands, products. And celebrity power shifts products. I got a picture of Pharrell Williams there. This is from our last show in New York. I'm going to come back to him. Another chapter in the book is about creative disruption. This, I, I use the example of G-Star. So um, there was a mention of uh, Dennis Hopper, so I get into this telling this little story. So fashion is always about breaking codes. You know, there's built-in obsolescence in the product. That's why they have to change it every six months. But uh, with denim, it's something that's you know, meant to last for a long time because it was never designed by a designer. It was made by a technician and was just appropriated into fashion. So this, uh, the owner said to me, you know, I want to go to New York Fashion Week. I want to do a fashion show. I want to put only denim on the stage, so no color, no flamboyance, nothing like this. But shit, to go into America where nobody knows us, I've got to have celebrity. Looked at me and said, yeah, you've got, to, you've got to do this for me. So then I thought, okay, disruption means going against the norm, breaking codes, this works in fashion. So we develop a creativity reactor where we use the celebrity as a catalyst. So it's like a scientific experiment, you know, to make a reaction go faster. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I sent a stupid email to Dennis Hopper, to a friend of mine who knew somebody who knew Dennis. Stupid email about Lars von Trier films, one in particular called Dogville and also Rudyard Kipling's poetry. And to my shock and horror, he replied back to me. Well, he got his assistant to reply back to me, but in his words. And he invited me to his house. So I started working with Dennis at his house. So at the same time, I was shooting Dennis in his house as a byproduct for my own art projects. This is what you see in the book. And what we decided to do was we decided to make a hijack in the middle of a fashion show in New York Fashion Week, stop the show, spend two minutes, Send, when people expect, you know, young, funky, cool denim brand from Europe, they expect super hot A-list Hollywood celebrity looking super hot. We didn't do this. We put a 72-year-old guy on the catwalk, made him look pretty good, and got him to recite poetry from the early 1900s. This blew the people away. I was sort of slowly making friends with Dennis, so we were able to bond and then do work not because we were going to put him in the ads and everybody knows that he's bought. Not for this. And he didn't need the money. So it's like taking something that's inside our art world thing for a lucky few, making it accessible, and putting it in front of another audience. So this is this other thing about how you, know, you can make brands more democratic. So I have a little bit, 20 years history of feeding this in. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. You can trust you. You can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for the doubting too. Or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good and talk too wise. If you can dream, but not make dreams your master. If you can think, but not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat these two imposters just the same, or bear to hear the truth that you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things that you've given your life to broken, and stoop and build them up again with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings, and risk it in one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and your nerve and your sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings, but never lose the common touch. 
If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distant run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Rest in peace, Mr. Hopper. So these signals became part of G-Star's brand mythology and added to its DNA from this exchange of energy with Dennis. So we just started doing more stuff together. So I'd made this idea about a virtual nightclub that went around the world that allowed DNA to diffuse with specific audiences around the world. So I would hijack different situations. So take a nightclub, cool nightclub, strip it, turn it into a museum, get it running like a museum with curators. So I did this with Dennis. One day at his house, he showed me in his garage photographs that he'd never shown, which were all hand-drawn billboard art from his photographs. So we decided to make Dennis one of the curators for my raw night idea, hijack a cart park, make it a public gallery so that the pictures are on the outside of the building, not inside, and then use the car parking space to make the club. Got some films from Quentin Tarantino, got Dennis's son in to do recycling art, Music by Mark Ronson's sister, so you had all this clash of infotainment. Creating an energy, and that energy in the brand is this idea of action plus art plus transmission. You know, understanding media to get it out. This makes change, because it changes people's perception, audience perce perception of the DNA. <laughs> So the thing is, a lot of this stuff, what it does is it's cheaper than advertising and it creates more impact. So G-Star ends up known in America, in the LA Times, you know, you do stuff that creates magnet, so celebrity comes to you. Another chapter is about how in the future it becomes more smart to own media and earn media rather than buy media. Why? Because a phone is no longer just a phone. The phones become people's alter ego and their main media sort of input. Media, again, is the thing that gives context to advertising or gives context to content. Consumers today, they're looking for more immersive, personal, intimate ways to embrace with media. This is why the context is quite important. And today, everything's condensed down into one single channel, and that's Channel of You. So, the whole thing's changed. The debate in advertising always ends up as, okay, do you spend a lot of money to buy brand awareness? So, okay, I've got high brand awareness, everything's good, eventually I have market share, everybody makes a lot of money. Possibly this doesn't work anymore, because impact possibly is cheaper and more efficient. Provided your content's right, provided you know what to amplify. You know, what dial do I turn up? Dial of celebrity, dial of ecology, dial of sustainability. But you've got to put your money where your mouth is. So it cannot be bullshit because the audience is savvy. So you've got to put your balls in the fire or money where your mouth is. Luckily, I have my friend Grant from Massive Attack here. Again, I reiterate, so I'm, there's a little thanks to him for helping me. But the music has been a key driver in helping me make all this, because it's probably helped me to put my balls in the fire whilst I've been working. And it's also about amplification, because music amplifies ideas. And in a way, 
you know, powerful advertising, powerful imagery, powerful brand image, it amplifies something that people care about. Today, you also got a context of uh, meltdown of high and low culture. So, power is concentrated in the world, like I said. Today, we have cyberspace kingdoms, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon. These guys have more power than governments because they can restrict con and control or manipulate people's freedom of speech, but at the same time, they propagate ideas and brands. So, this strange meltdown. Art culture, mall culture, clashes together. So high and low art mixed together. So you got this funny sort of plus minus, high low. That means that the discrete boundaries of any market, this where one starts, the other begins, this becomes arbitrary and artificial. So again, creates very optimistic time because we live in a blurred society. Conventions no longer apply. So everywhere is blurred, east, west. You know, structure, process, men, women, right, wrong. If you look at global terrorism, you know, these guys don't think they're wrong. And theoretically, they're driven by God. If you look at men, women, one of the most popular shows on Netflix today is Transparent, if anybody's sort of seen it. So it's about a guy who's a father and then at 60 decides, shit, I've always been a man in a woman's body. And the whole show is about, you know, transgender, hugely popular. And for brands, you know, desire, very important, because much of what we do is about desire creation. And I got a little chapter about the death of desire, which is really about satisfaction being the death of desire. So you never really want to satisfy that desire. You just want to pump that desire. So this is true of branding, but true of any individual in this room who ever wants to have sex again. So is the same. You don't want to satisfy that desire. And the thing with desire is that you've got to be able to stimulate momentum. You know, so you've got natural momentum. Energize, stimulate, natural momentum. This allows stuff to move around the world. If it has high relevancy, people take, up, take it up. Reason why this is important is because today, desire is very important because in today's world, economics is driven by it. So it means that the products and information, the ones that create wealth, are the ones that know how to play with people's desire. Because when products and information serves desire, this is what creates wealth and money. And at the end, Simplistically, much is about getting people horny for product in order to make a horny brand because people like to be horny. And I go back to Mr. Pharrell Williams now, who I believe in the world is, is you know, we could say he's quite a sort of uh, top of his game superstar that people think are good looking. So we made a project with Pharrell and uh, instead of putting him in the campaign like a bought celebrity, we decided, OK, we're not going to put you in the campaign. We're going to use elements of you as a catalyst. So we developed the world's first denim that we co-designed with him because he's also a man with taste who dresses well, has relevancy in our world of G-Star, in order to make the world's first jeans from recycled ocean plastic. So you've got 30% of a product is recycled plastic bottles. Dear human beings, we vacation by the oceans, we bathe in the oceans, we eat from the oceans, but very few of us think of the oceans beyond what we want from it. The oceans need us now, it's filling up with plastic and ruining the neighborhood. G-Star and Bionic Yarn want you to come together for Big Blue and wear the responsibility for the oceans. Happy life, happy human beings, and happy oceans. I'm because I'm happy. I'm alone if you feel
So, <laughs> so you see there an example of, okay, we don't put the celebrity in the ad, we make an octopus, we have a very serious subject about ecology, we're not the authority on ocean cleanup, so we link NGOs to it, multi-stakeholder project, very complicated, but in a way what it does is at the same time it proposes a solution where you, you take a problem, and then instead of only raising awareness, you put sustainability as a condition for doing business, and then you turn problem into product. The most sustainable form of design today is how you reuse waste to make new products. And plastic is a big problem. So capitalism has gone wrong, not because business is bad per se, but because there's not enough education of consumers. So with the Raw for the Ocean, Pharrell Project, Plastic Bottles to Denim, we also have a film coming out, People talk about environmental issues like this is what might happen in the future. We're here. The shit's hitting the fan now. It's weird that plastics could ever have such a profoundly dark effect on our future. 700,000 tons of plastic in our oceans. That's like a a resource waiting to be mined, waiting for people to profit from. When you look at ocean plastic, then you see first waste that is useless. But when you look again, you see a valuable working materials. I'm really hopeful, I'm not a pessimist when it comes to this. I think that there's light at the end of this tunnel. So that film's out in April. You should check it out, because it's not a commercial film, here's a pack shot at the end. It's a film that focuses on the true heroes who are actually doing stuff to clean up the ocean and, you know, activating themselves, and it features them. So again, this time we do use Pharrell's face, but he's not the hero in that film. So I want to thank you for listening to me. I hope you enjoyed it.